Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus today. I am Trace and I'm here with a very special guest, Dr. Sepna Parikh. She is a master's in public health, so she's able to talk a lot about hygiene, which is the topic for this week. Hopefully you've tuned into the three episodes that we've already done on hygiene. Today, episode four, we're talking about when we started caring so much about hygiene, we start making laws about it. I feel like you would probably know a little bit about. I hope so. Yeah. So important. So, so far we've talked about when we started using hygiene, whether or not we've been doing hygiene wrong, which that was pretty fun. Uh, and then also the religion and how religion's influence on hygiene has changed human history. But what about how laws have started to make hygiene super required, you know? Like it's illegal to be non-hygienic. Yeah, because it may, has such an impact not just on you or me, but on public health in general. And so it's sort of become regulated whether we like it or not, it impacts everybody. Your hygiene impacts everyone. And so we've had to regulate, we've had to create rules and laws to try and enforce. All of these are tough to enforce though. And yeah, I mean, you can't really go around swiping people's hands and being like, oh, you didn't wash your hands. Make sure, yes. Yeah, you can't really do that. I'm gonna fine you for not washing your hands. Right. So it's impossible. It's kind of bizarre, actually, but but super interesting just because of the historical aspects of like learning about this, right? Like, like we didn't really know what was going on microbially, right? Pet forever. Forever. For like, so long. Till germ theory comes about with uh, Louis Pasteur. And germ theory came out uh, in the 19th century. Well, the germ theory basically taught us that disease th is caused by these microorganisms, bacteria, viruses, which we kind of take for granted now in antibiotics and all that. But before that, they had no idea. There was some people thought it was spirits and different other conditions that were causing diseases, but it was this germ theory, when that was proven, it revolutionized everything and changed the way we think about hygiene and cleanliness. Yeah, we, we were fighting something that we now understood a little better. Yeah. You know, it wasn't just this kind of, like, I like that you use spirits, you know, this ethereal thing that, oh, this is hygiene, it's caused by this thing that we can't control. Now it's like, oh, well, it's caused by this thing that we can quantify and we can measure and we can say this is hygienic and this is not hygienic, right? And we can do something about it. Exactly. So there are three different dudes who uh, kind of come about <laughs> in the history. Three dudes. Three dudes. French chemist and microbiologist, Louis Pasteur, very famous, um, looked at the processes of decaying and rotting and putrefaction. And then he also started pasteurization. He's the reason we now have pasteurized milk. Yeah. To kill off bacteria by using a heating process. Cool. And there's also uh, English surgeon, uh, Joseph Lister. Yeah, he was huge. He revolutionized surgery. Everything we take for granted in terms of cleanliness in the operating room, how the surgeon scrubs, how the sterile equipment, everything, we, we take that for granted. But he was the one who kind of started that. B before him, people would often die after a completely successful surgery. They would die, they called it ward fever because they didn't know what was causing it. Mm. But it was these infections caused by unclean operating room practices. Hmm. So he's kind of known as the father of antiseptic surgery. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he's kind of important. I wonder if they named Listerine after him. I don't yes. Know. Did we were they? talking, yeah, and I looked this up for you. They that did? It's named after, they named yes. it after this guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Not that, you know, we're advocating yeah, for we're Listerine. Yeah, we're not advocating not. or advertised by Listerine. But kind of a fun, but that's kind of neat. random fact. What a fun yeah. fact. Huh. And then there's also a German physician, Robert Koch, who is the uh, founder of modern bacteriology. Uh, identified organisms that caused tuberculosis and cholera and started kind of picking out specific bacteria and saying like, oh, this one does this. Right. And that's cool because it's like, imagine a world where you suddenly discovered you were covered in bacteria. And it was so hard to get people to believe it because you couldn't see it. So right. it's like trying to tell somebody to believe, you know, this invisible thing is what's causing your fever and your sickness. It was just, it was tough. So before germ theory became commonplace, I mean, people didn't really understand any of these things. But now that we understand it and we have this concrete thing that we can measure and we can kind of battle, if you will, we're trying to prevent it. And in doing so, we end up making some laws and regulations to make people be more hygienic. Um, so I think a big one is obviously hospitals, which as somebody with a medical degree, I imagine you have some experience with, like, can you tell us a little bit about uh, something we looked up and we found called universal precautions? So there's two kind of categories in hospitals, and that one is to protect doctors. Okay. There's also, there are laws to protect patients, but universal precautions, also kind of called standard precautions, is basically the idea that doctors and healthcare workers should assume that all bodily fluids of patients 
are infected with Ooh. something, anything, whether it's hepatitis, HIV, you just assume that it's infected. And so that's the reason doctors and healthcare workers wear masks and gloves and gowns. And mm-hmm. you, now you should see your dentist, your, your dental hygienist wearing they a mask the, the even. Things yeah. on their face now. All of that. Yeah. You just, it's the idea to assume that bodily fluids are infected and protect yourself. Okay. And then for protecting patients, we have like the hospital acquired infections, HAIs. Right? HAI. And those yeah. are terrible. They're Ter- the worst. The worst and getting worse, it's become such a big topic. It's the concept of you go into the hospital and you acquire or get an infection. Mm-hmm. That could be completely unrelated to what you went for. So whether it's from your IV or your incision site, it's just because there's bacteria floating around. Around a hospital because the, the hospital's full of sick people. I like the idea that there's both precautions for the patients, which you, makes perfect sense. You know, most people are patients when they go to a hospital. You know, most people that are going to go to a hospital are not doctors, but doctors also need to be protected, which I didn't know anything about. I think that's super cool. And there are laws now to protect patients against these hospital acquired infections and that's kind of a new thing Mm -hmm. where now hospitals are being held accountable so it varies state to state but a lot of states now have hai laws Mm -hmm. which means that they have to report these hospital acquired infections and it sort of differs how much they have to report what they have to report and then the latest healthcare law, the Affordable Care Act, which you know is insurance and mm-hmm. that whole exchange, but it also has um, some provisions in there where hospitals have to pay a lot more. Um, they have to pay fines for these hospital-acquired infections. Hmm. So there's some incentive for hospitals to do a better job right. for patients. We've talked a little bit about this uh, on the, the main show, D News, about like doctors in the future might not have sleeves on their their gowns because sleeves can get drug through surfaces and pick up bacteria. Bacteria and fabric is a huge carrier of bacteria. So if you make short sleeves, although it doesn't look as fancy, <laughs> it's more hygienic, which I thought that was kind of cool. And also turning hospitals into like steampunk paradises and covering them in copper and like, cause copper- As a substance, so it's it easier It kills to bacteria, right. okay. like just naturally. Bacteria left on a copper surface will just die because of the way copper works. They'll just be killed after a few hours. So, so I'm picturing cool. a copper, an entirely copper hospital with doctors and tank tops. Oh man. And no- it's the future <laughs> guys. This That's is the, the future. future. <laughs> but it's so true because you, do, I mean, there's stethoscopes you use from one patient to the next and they're wearing scrubs, you know, and you go from room to room and you're just the patient. So you can't tell them to, yeah. hey, can you wipe off that stethoscope? You know, it's yeah. just awkward. So but. strange. And all of this kind of started um, back during the Civil War uh, here in the U.S. But in Europe, there was this pretty famous a woman, Florence Nightingale, who was a nurse tending to the wounded during the Crimean War in the mid-19th century, about the same time as the American Civil War, and was working in just the worst conditions in hospitals in England. Just the worst conditions in this military hospital. And she was amazing. She is kind of thought of as a pioneer who revolutionized the hospital conditions. She's fought for more sanitary conditions and fought to say, hey, this is why these soldiers, these patients are dying. It's not from the wounds, it's from these infections. And the reason is because we have these unsanitary conditions. And and again, we take it for granted now, but at that time she had to fight for it and Mm -hmm. prove that it was worth making changes. And she did. Right. Yeah. Queen Victoria actually met with Florence Nightingale and and because of that meeting potentially set up the Royal Commission, which looked into the health of the army. And they found with data, they were like, oh, 16 or 18,000 deaths were not from battle wounds, but were just from preventable diseases because of poor sanitation. And also as a former worker at a museum talking about the 19th century, we learned a lot about how much of the death during the Civil War, you know, more than 100,000 soldiers, 150,000 soldiers died, but most of that was due to infections after battles, not during battles, which is crazy, just poor sanitation all around. But how is it today that we're making hospitals more sanitary? Like you mentioned a few things and talked about sleeves and copper and stuff, but what about things like, uh, like hand washing, is that, how does that work in hospitals? Do you have to wash your hands all the time, constantly throughout the day? Or is there, what, what kind of regulations do they have to make hospitals more sanitary? There are a bunch of things and it's kind of more policy, I guess I think of it, and not the laws sort of oversee the having to report those infections. And mm-hmm. some of the laws are a little more specific. They monitor antibiotics that you give patients before surgery, for example. But a lot of these things you're talking about are policies. Okay. So. Definitely, there's hand washing between every patient. 
you'll now see the antiseptic, um, you know, gels all over the walls. That's kind of a newer thing in the last few years. And then the precautions kind of vary by the area. If you have certain patients with really infectious diseases, they're put into isolation rooms that have negative ventilation, and there's carts outside where everybody that enters and goes in, you have to put on booties over your shoes and disposable gowns and masks. You have to be a little more extra careful um, mm-hmm. in those situations. And then kind of also newer is the whole issue with scrubs. You used to see doctors and nurses wearing scrubs home. Now there are some hospitals have rules. You you can't wear them home. Yeah, you have to come in and put oh, on yeah, fresh scrubs. That's a whole other thing. You're wearing them outside the hospital into this uncontrolled environment. On the buses or yeah, public you go transportation, to a, like and, a fast food joint, and you might sit somewhere that you then don't want to bring back to the hospital. Right. Yeah. So oh, varies, man. but there's a lot. Which it just seems like you said there's a lot, and I think that's almost an understatement. It seems like there's it's an impossible amount of things to manage. Every point of contact for every employee and patient cannot be like accounted for. Or taken for granted. And it's or be enforced. Right. So, you know, people are rushed. Yeah. People are busy. To go out of the hospital a little bit, another big area of um, hygiene that has a lot of laws around it that people interact with is the food industry, which is super interesting because if you would like, I don't know, in the 20s or something, you would go to somebody's house and they would make you food. You know, and that was a huge deal. And now more probably going to restaurants to eat. And restaurants are professional versus personal, so they have to be more regulated. And we have laws that now do that. I mean, a big one that I think everyone notices as a restaurant goer is the signs in the bathroom, you know. Employees must wash their hands right. after using the bathroom. It's right. something like that. Yeah. Everywhere. They're all over the place. But when we were doing research for this episode, we couldn't find any federal laws saying it was illegal for you to not wash your hands. Just recommendations from the Food and Drug Administration. No, like, federal statute saying wash your hands before you prepare food. Then it kind of comes down to, you know, local regulations. And a lot of that falls to the health departments and to the health inspectors. And in New York, for example, the inspectors have unannounced visits to these restaurants. And they go in and they look at these things. And the criteria, some of them involve personal hygiene, but it's hard to measure. But they look at the conditions of the work surfaces and the temperature of the food. And and then in some states, they give them these grades. You mm-hmm. know, in New York, they yeah. have these grades the where big, they the post them. The big frickin' letters on the front of the building. Letter. You know exactly what this is. This is an A place. Most places are A places. And even the A places can have up to, I think, about 12 or 13 violation points. Wow. So even it's not even a, you know, a sign of perfection, but it's, again, hard to enforce. Yeah. I mean, what ends up probably happening more is that something really bad happens and the restaurant just can't handle it financially. You know, there are all these other issues that if maybe they get a large enough violation, it's easier to just close than to maintain them and fix it. If you don't know to clean up after yourself, you can spread disease everywhere everywhere which is like the typhoid mary situation and she didn't know she typhoid mary this is from the early 1900s she's i guess infamous Mm -hmm. for what happened she she didn't know she was a carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever and so that that bacteria was in her stool they later found in her feces but she didn't know and she was an immigrant and worked as a cook in many different places, first with a family and then in more institution settings. And I think by the end infected up to almost 50 people. Yikes. And three people died in the end, but she didn't know she was a carrier and didn't have symptoms. Right, but oh, and that's a whole other thing. You which know, is a whole other thing. Yeah. But she's kind of proof of why hygiene is so important and why it's so tough to enforce. There are also laws about keeping kids clean. Uh, you know, it, it's hygiene has become so important to so many people that now it can be considered in some places a form of child neglect or child abuse if the child has poor hygiene, if they're malnourished, if they need better dental care, medical care, uh, if they have unwashed bodies or their hair is, is dirty so they end up maybe getting lice or something and then bringing that into a more public school situation. Or even if they just smell bad, some of those things are illegal. Doesn't that seem crazy? It does seem crazy. But again, it's like for the for the greater good. I know in some day in a lot of daycares you can't 
bring your child. They'll send your child home if they have diarrhea or a fever. Mm-hmm. They'll call you at home and I'm tell saying. you to come get your child yeah. for the sake of everybody else. Yeah. We can also get sick from unsafe bathrooms because of all of that fecal material. And, and we definitely don't want to get it into like the outgoing water supply to people's houses. So all of these things need to be managed. And the more people we have in one place and the more uh, we understand bacterial movement and pathogen pathways, Um, the more controls we kind of need, right? And the laws, even though I know people just hate having more and more laws, but they really make a difference. You see it in, my parents are from India, and it's just amazing to see the conditions of the bathrooms Mm. and how it's not regulated. And then, and they don't have, you know, a lot of the toilets are latrines, there are holes in the ground and we bring our own toilet paper and where do you dispose of that? But then you see the consequences. You see the beaches. There's a beach on the West Coast where it looks so beautiful and you walk up and you smell. It smells like rotten eggs. There's sewage leaking into the water. You can't even go in there. Yeah. And you see the consequences of what happens when we don't have these laws. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say it. It's easy to poo-poo these laws <laughs> when you don't have to experience that. Thanks so much for being on, Sapna. You're like I mean, such a awesome like public health specialist. How often do you get to talk to somebody about that? Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Where can people find you if they want to talk um, more about public health or you know science in general? You can find me on Twitter. Supna underscore Parik. And you can also find me on Twitter. I'm at Trace Dominguez. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about what happens if people stop caring about hygiene. Not just as a society. I mean, like, if I decided to never shower again, what would happen to us if we just stopped caring about it? Let us know down in the comments how you feel about public health and kind of laws around sanitation. Are there laws that we should have that we don't have? Tell us in the comments. And keep coming back here. we got one more episode of Hygiene. See you tomorrow.